How you doing guys? Our video today is about working in confined or enclosed spaces. While seafarers are working on board ships, they may face some dangerous events such as collision, fire, sinking, flooding, and even some minor incidents such as falls, trips, or slips, which are considered the most common accidents on board ships. However, there is a working activity as dangerous as the incidents mentioned before. For most seafarers, the term confined or enclosed space rings a bell, and they know that entering or working into confined or enclosed spaces is a dangerous task since many people have been killed or seriously injured while being inside without an adequate plan or convenient personal protective equipment. According to the National Statistic Workplace Safety and Health, 15% of the workplace fatalities are due to work-related accidents in confined or enclosed spaces. Thus, entering and working in confined or enclosed spaces can be deadly. A confined or enclosed space is an enclosed area which has limited openings for entry and exit. Although it is large enough for a person to enter, it has neither favorable ventilation nor a design for continuous worker occupancy. Some common examples of confined and enclosed spaces on board ships include boilers, cargo holes, cargo tanks, ballast tank, double bottom, double hole, sewage tanks, pound rooms, compressor rooms, and cover them as well. Hence, personnel entering or working in enclosed or confined spaces may come across some dangers such as oxygen deficiency that require oxygen concentration for safety entry into an enclosed or confined space is between 19.5 to 23.5 percent. Lower oxygen concentration may result in difficulty in breathing, headache, and consciousness, or even death. Fire and explosion, the accumulation of flammable gases, fumes, and vapors may lead to a fire or even an explosion in the enclosed space. Poisoning, the presence of toxic gases, fumes, or vapors may also harm the worker's health in the enclosed space leading to death. Drowning, an increase on the water level in the enclosed space may lead to workers drowning. Suffocation, the presence of free-flowing solids in the air of the enclosed or confined space may lead to workers' suffocation. Lost consciousness, as a result of an increase in the worker's body temperature, the lost consciousness is a common incident in confined or enclosed spaces. Due to these hazards, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, as well as the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, set some regulations and guidelines so that ship personnel could recognize, evaluate, correct, and control hazardous situations. According to this, many factors must be evaluated before entering into an enclosed space or working around one. These evaluations include searching for the presence of flammable, toxic, oxygen depleting, or enriching agents in spaces containing organic materials such as fruits, vegetables, natural fiber lines, standing seawater, which potentially deplete 
the oxygen and may further deteriorate into methane or worst into hydrogen sulfide. That's why entering or working in confined or enclosed spaces cannot be improvised. Therefore, the officer in charge must call for a risk assessment meeting first in order to identify health hazards and consider the measures to be taken to minimize risk inside the enclosed space. Moreover, warning signs must be displayed at every entry point of the enclosed or confined space to warn against unauthorized entry. Furthermore, personnel must be sure that the entry permit is valid and has been correctly endorsed by the supervisor, the surveyor, and the officer in charge. So, no one can enter or work in an enclosed or confined space without a valid entry permit. In addition, an entry permit must clearly indicate identification and location of the enclosed or confined space, purpose of entry, date, time, and limit exposure, potential hazards identified, and countermeasures to be taken, ventilation and lighting arrangement, atmospheric testing results, and an enclosed space attendant or standby designated person. Any work to be carried out in an enclosed or confined space requires the presence of a standby who is going to be stationed outside monitoring personnel entering and working inside, as well as keeping communication with the workers in the enclosed or confined space, and in the event of an emergency, he or she must immediately raise the general alarm and activate the emergency rescue plan. Therefore, the supervisor must apply for the confined entry permit, so before filling up the entry permit, a surveyor must accompany him to inspect the enclosed space and conduct a gas test. The results must be recorded and sent to be authorized by the officer in charge. Once the officer in charge is sure that the enclosed space or the confined space is safe and appropriate control measures are in place, the officer in charge will approve and issue the entry permit. Before the work begins, a copy of the endorsed entry permit must be clearly displayed at the entrance of the enclosed or confined space. Most toxic or flammable gases and oxygen deficiency as well cannot be easily detected, so it is important to test the atmosphere of the enclosed space and ensure that it is safe for entry. Thus, in a typical gas test, the surveyor tests for oxygen level first. Acceptable range for oxygen level concentration for safe entry is between 19.5% to 23.5%. Oxygen level less than 19.5% and greater than 23.5% is considered IDLH. Secondly, the surveyor tests for the presence of flammable gases or vapor. The concentration of these gases must not exceed 10% of the lower explosive limit. Concentration of 10% or greater of the lower explosive limit will render the atmosphere IDLH. Finally, the surveyor must test for the presence of toxicants and volatile organic compounds to ensure 
that their concentration are below the permissible level. Common toxicants on board ship include hydrocarbons, hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and benzene. Enclosed space ventilation is a key procedure to be carried out to guarantee the safe working conditions of the workers since this procedure captures and removes contaminants from the space and provides fresh air for health and general comfort. There are three basic types of ventilation. General ventilation. It is used to provide uncontaminated air for breathing and keeping general comfort for the personnel. The accepted practice of general ventilation is one complete air change every three minutes. Local exhaust ventilation. This system contains an exhaust bore intake position near the source that generates the contaminants. Contaminants are captured as they are generated and removed. This type of ventilation is more effective for removing contaminants generated from welding or solvent cleaning. Dilution ventilation. It is a portable system that withdraws air out of the space and replaces the stagnant air with fresh air by natural air circulation. The contaminated air within the space may be diluted to a safe level. When working into an enclosed or confined space, a safe working environment is a must. Nevertheless, there are times when it is not possible to achieve the desired safe working environment or the entry into the confined or enclosed space is the result of an emergency rescue operation. When this happens, respiratory protective equipment must be used. There are two common types of respiratory protective equipment. The self contained breathing apparatuses or SCBA and the air purifying respirators. SCBAs are used for entering into or escaping from atmospheres which are immediately dangerous to life and health or IDLH. They may be closed circuit or open circuit demand. On the other hand, Air purifying respirators is a filtration device that cleans the air. Nevertheless, the air purifying respirator cannot be used in oxygen deficiency environments, poorly ventilated enclosed spaces, areas where the concentration of toxic contaminants are unknown, areas immediately dangerous to life and health or areas where the concentration of contaminants is higher than the device filter capacity. Some other personal protective equipment includes protective clothing such as overall safety helmet, goggles or safety glasses, earring protection, glove, safety booth, and safety harnesses as well. A proper emergency rescue plan must include an emergency rescue control point to provide quick emergency rescue assistance, medical service, and treatment. The rescue control point must be located immediately adjacent or next to the space. Besides, The emergency rescue control point must be manned with a convenient number of trained and qualified personnel to enable rescue operations. Consequently, rescue personnel who enter a space to perform a rescue operation must be equipped with approved and tested 
SCBA. They must also have safety harnesses, torch lights, Robertson stretchers, and life lines, as well as other personal protective equipment convenient to the space conditions. As we have seen, entering or working into an enclosed or confined space doesn't have anything to do with improvising. Therefore, all the activities carried out in enclosed or confined spaces must be properly planned. That's why entering and working in an enclosed space without proper preparation or equipment can endanger your life. That's all folks. Thank you for your attention. See you next video.